Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Amit Levy uh, visit us. Uh, Amit is a PhD student at uh, Stanford. And before that, he was actually uh, undergrad and a fifth year master's student at UW. So we have known him for now close to a decade, actually, nine or 10 years. Um, he's been uh, working on a, a lot of problems at the intersection of uh, system security and operating systems and maybe even programming languages. His initial uh, uh, PhD work was in the space of how do you make uh, Facebook kind of infrastructure secure for privacy leaks? And I can, you know, an appropriate topic for today's age. Uh, but that's not what he's going to be talking about today. He's going to be talking about uh, security for IoT uh, systems. And uh, I'm going to pass things along to Amit now. Thanks, Arvind. Uh, thanks for having me. It's wonderful to be, to be here, to be back here. Uh, and a lot of the work that I will talk about today was kind of inspired by work that was either originally done here or was done by Dan Grossman elsewhere, but now he's here. So, <laughs> uh, so this is really exciting for me. OK. So uh, there's something like 20 million programmers in the world today. So that's a huge number of people that can obviously build software and hopefully you know, improve computer systems for the, for the better. Uh, but in practice, their sort of power to actually uh, extend and improve the systems on which they build software is pretty limited. So for example, on things like operating systems, if you want access to sort of the most powerful interfaces, then you had better be you know, a, a, a kernel module that's fully privileged or uh, maybe a process that has sort of root access or other kinds of special privileges. On web platforms like Facebook, uh, you know, we have this trade-off, unfortunately, where, you know, uh, they often have third-party application APIs, and so people can sort of extend the platform in some ways, but if you want to rebuild the core features, you really need privileged access to user data. And then in this space of the Internet of Things, it's, uh, it's even worse. Uh, typically, only a handful of developers control the entire software stack, not just the core services. And so the question that sort of inspires a lot of the work that I've been doing is, you know, what would the world look like if these 20 million programmers had access to the same APIs as the people building those APIs? And so, right, the point is that people that build these systems, like Mark Zuckerberg, it's not the, the point is not that he's a bad person, uh, even though he may be. The, the point is that there's sort of real technical challenges here. When somebody sits down to build one of these systems, there's often this trade-off. You can choose between empowering the programmer with sort of more flexibility and more power, uh, or you can build a secure system that enforces end-user privacy goals or, or maybe uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, controls resources securely. And so my goal is to try to design systems that, uh, that really eliminate or at least drastically reduce this trade-off between security of the system and the flexibility of third-party applications. And actually, I think that you know, if we do this correctly, there's a, a bonus here where uh, we can actually improve the security of the system overall, because even trusted developers uh, have to write less code that's sort of security sensitive. And so even if you don't care about these 20 million developers, uh, I think this is still, still a useful goal to strive for in system design. Um, OK, so there's sort of a standard way of doing secure systems research. Uh, if we have some problem that we want to solve, say things like buffer overflows, then we might articulate a threat model for it, uh, say that the end user can give us you know, arbitrary strings to our program, arbitrary inputs to our program. And then we'll either create or choose some security mechanism that can address that threat model, something like stack canaries, for example, and then build a system using that mechanism and port a bunch of existing applications to this new system. And if we've done all this well and we've chosen the threat model properly, then we can actually reduce the attack surface of the system. So this is a, a great uh, way of doing research. It's actually been very impactful in terms of you know, really improving the security of sort of existing deployed systems out there. But it doesn't get at the kinds of questions that I'm interested in. It doesn't tell us sort of how it might impact these 20 million developers' ability to, to innovate on the system. Uh, on the flip side, there's this sort of line of extensible systems research, which is sort of subtly different. So this time, well, we might you know, create or choose some fancy security mechanism and then articulate a threat model to sort of match it, the sort of most strict threat model that we can come up with that the security mechanism can satisfy. And then uh, we'll design a new API around the security mechanism and build a system around that API, and then write a whole bunch of new applications that weren't possible before. So this is also wonderful and I think has resulted in a bunch of really beautiful research systems. But we don't tend to see uh, the techniques coming out of this research sort of be actually being used in practice for the most part. And you know, my hypothesis is that 
while these research systems sort of in theory allow anybody to extend the system, in practice, if you're not you know, an operating systems PhD student that specializes in secure systems, uh, you're, you're going to have a hard time sort of uh, cracking these APIs and, and building systems and writing policies for them. So I think the takeaway is that we really need to build systems that are not only extensible in principle, but also extendable uh, in practice. And as researchers, as system designers, the, the kind of one tool we have is the API. And so we need to get the API uh, right. And you know, I think the two ways in which APIs tend to fall short in this respect is uh, either you know, we might design APIs that are secure but are not very expressive. And so then the developer just can't do what they want. They can't build their application. Uh, they might even sort of work with the end user to sort of subvert the system completely. And on the other hand, we might build uh, very extensible, very expressive APIs, but then they might be very brittle and error prone. So I need to insert checks all over my application. And if I get one wrong or if I miss a check, then my application might break or I might violate security properties. Uh, and so I think to sort of get the best of the, both of these worlds to subsume this trade-off, we need to come up with novel abstractions for designing these APIs. Um, and you know, one principle that has worked for me, I think, in, in my own research is to try and think from the developer perspective, what, you know, what do they really want to accomplish? And then figure out what API can sort of coax exactly the right information out of the developer that still lets us enforce policies, but is sort of not too restrictive. Uh, but you know, that's just a principle. And ultimately, I think this is an empirical question. Right? We only know what the right API is if we've actually evaluated it with, uh, with real developers, with practitioners. So that's kind of what I do. I, I build systems uh, that try to empower these programmers without sacrificing system security. And I tend to lean on a lot of tools from programming languages, including type-safe programming languages and mechanisms like information flow control. And then I try to evaluate these systems with real developers, with practitioners. And so, so far I've done this in sort of a number of settings, including distributed storage and web platforms uh, and low power wireless network gateways, and then most recently uh, operating system kernels. Uh, and so, you know, I'm an operating systems researcher, but, uh, but I end up collaborating with a, a people from a, a sort of variety of areas be, because of this. So, you know, obviously people in operating systems, but then of course people in security and programming languages, and then uh, most recently with uh, sensor network folks because uh, I think that's a, a really interesting domain to apply these problems, uh, these questions rather. Okay, so today I'm gonna talk about uh, three different projects uh, that I've worked on and I'll primar primarily focus on uh, TALK, which is an operating system for microcontrollers and then just very briefly in a couple slides touch on two other projects, uh, Hales and Beetle. Okay. So TALK is a secure operating system for, uh, for microcontrollers. So why operating systems and why microcontrollers? Uh, well, operating systems, I hope, is sort of self-explanatory. I'm an operating systems researcher. But, uh, but microcontrollers, I think, are actually a, a great place to explore these questions. And, and the reason is that I think that one way in which previous research has fallen short is that it's actually very difficult to try and deploy these systems in practice. And the reason is that you know we're typically battling these very ossified operating systems like Linux and Windows and so forth. And if you're asking somebody to replace one of these systems, even just to try out, you're asking them to, to replace not only sort of decades of APIs and software, but also system administration tools and experience. But microcontrollers are these totally different beasts. Um, so a microcontroller is the, typically a small sort of system on a chip computer that has relatively little resources. So 64 kilobytes of RAM is a pretty representative number. And it doesn't have the same kinds of uh, hardware mechanisms for protection that we're used to from other systems. So in, in, in particular, it doesn't typically have virtual memory. And so as a result, we just can't use the kinds of systems that we're used to, like Linux, on these uh, kinds of computers. And so people don't. They just write basically bare metal code. Uh, you know, They might use a, one of a handful of frameworks for writing code for these devices, but at the end of the day, they end up with sort of a single monolithic piece of code for their uh, sort of system and application that has no boundaries. There's no isolation between, uh, between components in the code. And at the same time, people are using these microcontrollers for completely new kinds of applications that really demand some notion of, of isolation. So things like USB security keys uh, for things like second factor are actually running multiple functions at the same time uh, that are totally independent. Sensor networks might run experiments from different research groups at the same time on the same infrastructure. And then wearables like fitness watches may even allow third party uh, developers, may, may allow end users to install third party applications. Um, 
okay, and so to dig into just one of these examples, let's look at these uh, USB authentication keys. So, you know, these are actually pretty complex systems. As I said, they run multiple applications at the same time, so typically a, uh, a couple of second fa factor authentication applications as well as uh, some encryption application like maybe a GPG smart card emulator. And I, I also think that these are exactly the kinds of devices that many of us might want to program. You know, maybe UW uses a different sec second factor authentication mechanism than Stanford does, or maybe I'd want to add something like a password manager to it. Um, but ultimately, the company that makes these devices, they determine that the isolation boundaries between the components in the system are just not strong enough to justify sort of allowing uh, third party applications without sacrificing, potentially sacrificing the security of these applications. And so the result is, you know, a handful of developers that happen to work at Ubico basically control the entire software stack. So I think that this sort of mismatch between the way that we write software for these devices and these new applications that are really requiring some notion of isolation is an opportunity to deploy research systems if we can actually provide sort of ways of, of building more robust software. So, you know, what does this system look like if we want to allow 20 million programmers uh, to program it? So I said that kind of the main problem is that we don't have isolation. So we know we want some kind of isolation. And so now we can start to talk about, you know, who writes the different components in the system. In some sense, what's the, what's the threat model? So at the lowest level, uh, there's the platform providers. So these are the people that build the hardware. Uh, they choose which component go on the, on, the, on the device, on the board. And they're also going to be responsible for sort of the lowest level of software, the sort of trusted computing base on the system that uh, you know, sort of lifts the hardware into, into something that software can talk about. And so I think you know, fundamentally these, these folks have to basically be totally trusted. They control the hardware and, and what base software goes on the device. Uh, but it's still, I think, really important to make sure that it's possible for these people to extend whatever system we come up with in a way that still you know, doesn't trivially violate security guarantees. It should be possible to extend the TCB safely. But then most of the operating system services on the device are actually going to be written by other people in practice. Uh, so these might be folks like peripheral device vendors that provide device drivers for their particular sensors or actuators, or maybe the open source community collaborating on a networking protocol or virtualization layers. And the platform providers are going to select exactly which operating system services will run on their particular device. And so they have some chance to maybe audit these components, but of course, auditing is not going to catch all bugs, and we know that these are exactly the kinds of components that, uh, uh, where lots of sort of kernel vulnerabilities show up. And so I think it's a really important goal to be able to protect the kernel at least from safety violations inside these components so that we can have some sort of guarantees about safety. And then finally, there's application developers. These are the 20 million people that are going to be building third-party applications for these devices. Uh, and because of that, you know, our goal is to allow end users to basically install, ideally, whatever third-party applications they might want. And so I think we, we basically have to treat these applications as potentially malicious. We don't know who the developers are, and we certainly can't audit the code, so we have to assume that they might try and do sort of arbitrary things to subvert system safety or, or liveness. Okay, so about three and a half years ago, uh, my collaborators and I were talking about these, uh, these problems and this model of thinking about embedded systems. And two of my collaborators at Berkeley, uh, Michael and Gabe, wanted to try and explore these questions in an embedded systems class that they were going to be teaching the next semester. And so they kind of went back to the operating systems literature and tried to figure out what they could do to provide isolation you know, without, uh, without virtual memory. And a, a you know, pretty intuitive solution was to use type safety. This is kind of, at this point, used in a bunch of different systems in the research. So they took TinyOS, which is uh, an embedded system uh, from the research that's sort of particularly good at low resource overhead, and use that to build the sort of very low level base of the system that basically lifted the hardware platform that they were using up into software. But then on top of TinyOS, they ported the Lua runtime to run on top of it. Lua is a small sort of embeddable dynamic type safe language. And the idea is that you know, most of these uh, operating system components as well as the application would be written in these, uh, inside of these Lua sandboxes. Uh, they were using Lua coroutines, but we can sort of think of them as basically being language level threads. And you know, I can tell you that after, after having spent about a year writing TinyOS code in this like, weird language called Nessie that TinyOS uses, that getting to uh, being able to write code in kind of a normal language like Lua was, uh, was a joy. Uh, 
And in fact, you know, Michael and Gabe ported a bunch of their sensor network applications to this platform. Uh, and overall, I think we were pretty happy with it, um, although it was you know, a pretty uh, bare bones prototype. But when they gave this to the class, you know, it didn't work out so well. In particular, the students kept writing code that would uh, run out of memory for a particular component, and there was sort of no choice but to crash the whole system. So what's going on here, I think, is that with such little memory, with 64 kilobytes or so, you know, any sort of dynamic heap allocation is a threat to system stability, and so that needs to be controlled somehow. And in Lua, this happens with garbage collection, but the sort of model of having garbage, a garbage collected language that really encourages sort of shared pointers across, uh, across components uh, is problematic, because we just don't know when, when something might be, when some allocation might be free. It's very difficult to reason about. So in particular, we're sort of missing two, I think, important pieces of information from the component developer. You know, who do we charge for a particular memory allocation in, in some component? And when might it be safe to, to free that memory in the future? So okay, yeah, you know, Michael and Gabe sort of went with this design uh, because we didn't have at least traditional hardware protection mechanisms. Uh, and you know, I think a language like Lua is probably not gonna be appropriate for this particular scenario, but we have other kinds of tools today. In particular, new microcontrollers have this hardware mechanism called the memory protection unit, which doesn't have virtual memory, but does provide uh, sort of fine-grained protection bits for a, a small number of memory regions. And so I think we can probably use uh, the MPU to uh, uh, provide like a, a process-like abstraction, at least, for, for these applications. And then there's other languages other than Lua, in particular languages like Rust, which are able to provide type safety without relying on garbage collection. Uh, for memory management. And so maybe we can use Rust to at least prevent type uh, safety violations in the kernel, but at a very, very low overhead. And so that's what we did. Uh, we built an operating system called Talk, which provides processes using the MPU and uh, an abstraction that we call capsules inside the kernel that uses uh, the Rust language. And we have a mechanism called grants to manage uh, memory that's sort of shared between, uh, between processes in the kernel. And so I'll go into each one of these mechanisms in a bit of detail, but at a high level, you know, processes are sort of standalone executables that can be written in any language. In particular, you know, most people write uh, talk processes in C. Um, uh, and uh, they're completely untrusted, so they're super appropriate for these applications that you know, could do anything. And then capsules are just Rust code that's linked in, into the kernel, typically for things like device drivers and virtualization layers. Uh, and so uh, capsules are not trusted for safety as we wanted, but they are, they do have to be trusted for liveness. So if a capsule spins in a while one loop, that still could, could brick the, the microcontroller. Okay, so processes are just, you know, similar to processes that we're used to from other systems. Uh, they're isolated by the hardware. And in particular, every process gets its own dedicated memory region that the hardware enforces, you know, no other processes can touch. Um, and that memory region you know, hosts the process stack, and if it wants to, it can have a heap or some global variables. And because each process has its own stack, we can schedule it preemptively, and so it's perfectly fine for a process to run some expensive computation, because we can just switch to another process or back into the kernel if we need to. And then finally, they communicate using system calls in IPC, just like in, in many other systems. Uh, but the result of this is that they have fairly high overhead. So first of all, they each have to have their own dedicated memory region for at least a stack. And so that costs some memory up front. Uh, and they have to context switch whenever they communicate either with the kernel or, or other processes. Uh, and that's you know, relatively expensive. So for certain kinds of operations, like if I need to toggle a pin on the chip very quickly, then you know, a process is kind of a non-starter. It's gonna take too long. But for other kinds of operations, like if I wanna send a large buffer over a serial port, you know, sending that buffer is gonna take 11 milliseconds or so, and so what's another 100 microseconds to sort of configure the, uh, the device? And these are exactly the kinds of operations that typically applications do, sort of high level operations. But for the ones where we, we can't afford this overhead, we have capsules. So a capsule is basically just a Rust module, some structs, uh, the fields associated with that struct, and maybe some methods and, global and, uh, and statically allocated variables. Uh, and in talk, we compile capsules into a sort of single-threaded event-driven kernel. And these capsules can technically block each other, but they only have access to asynchronous I.O. For, so for the most part, if they are performing mostly I.O., they, they, they won't block for very long, at least. Um, and as a result of this, they sort of share a single stack, so we don't need to allocate separate stacks for each capsule. Uh, 
and they have no access to a global shared heap. That's important because, you know, of all the pieces in the system, the kernel really needs to be reliable. And they communicate just using regular references and method calls in the Rust language, so nothing, nothing fancy there. But the upshot is that these are often inlined, and so the result is that if we compile a talk kernel constructed of these capsules, in the end we're gonna end up with something that looks and behaves basically very similarly to, to, to a kernel that was written in C uh, with no isolation at all. So to, to see how, uh, you know, kind of what the overhead here is, uh, we took two different applications uh, sort of on the ends of the spectrum. So one is a Blink application, which is kind of the embedded systems hello world, and a, a more fully featured kind of sensor network style application that basically samples some sensors every now and again and sends the values over a six low pan network. And then we implemented both of those applications using a talk kernel, so no processes, just capsules, and, uh, and TinyOS, that research system that Michael and Gabe use for, uh, uh, for their uh, original design. And then we compare those applications in terms of their overhead in code size, that's the ROM, and how much memory consume, the, the amount of RAM that they consume. And so we can see that in the sort of minimal example, this Blink application, you know, TinyOS consumes a little bit more uh, ROM but uses significantly less memory. That makes sense because that's kind of the focus of TinyOS is to, uh, uh, to optimize uh, RAM by paying a little bit extra in ROM. And also it doesn't have certain, ki kind of, kind of, certain kinds of components by default like a process scheduler. But you know, once we go up to a sort of more fully featured application, these differences are sort of in the noise. So that's kind of what we would hope for. And despite this relatively low overhead, we can still enforce pretty rich isolation semantics. So this code is taken from the DMA driver in talk for one of the platforms that talk supports, the SAM4L, excuse me. And the goal of this capsule, the DMA channel uh, capsule, is to take a hardware interface, which basically lets the software sort of tell the DMA controller where to read and write memory to from other buses and expose that to other parts of the kernel, to other capsules. And the interface is basically, you know, give me a base pointer and a length and that's what I'll transfer. But of course, that's not an interface that we can expose to the rest of the kernel because that would allow, you know, any component to basically read and write to arbitrary memory. Like we, we don't want that. And so uh, the DMA channel is gonna make these fields private. You know, we can tell that it's private because there's no pub keyword in front of the fields. And then expose a method, the send buffer method that instead of a base uh, pointer in length takes a Rust slice, which is basically a bounds checked array. And so this is actually giving us a ton of information, right? First of all, because this, uh, this slice is type safe, we know that the client can't just create it out of thin air, it must have access to this memory. And so you'll notice that in the implementation for send buffer, there's no checks about the, you know, sort of where the, the base pointer is or how long the buffer is, because we just know that whoever called us must be able to, um, to read this memory. And then this weird tick static, that's uh, part of the type of the slice, is a Rustism called a lifetime, which specifies basically you know, when a value might be deallocated. And tick static means it'll never be deallocated. And so that's telling us that there's no way for the, uh, for the DMA operation to complete after this value has been deallocated, because of course it never gets deallocated. Okay, so until now I've talked about these relatively two separate, two different kinds of worlds. One are these uh, capsules which are sort of completely static. We know exactly which ones are gonna be compiled into the kernel when we, compile, when we build the kernel. They don't have access to a heap. Uh, and on the other hand, we have these processes which are basically totally dynamic. They can do whatever they want with their memory. They can ask for arbitrary resources and we don't even know which ones are gonna run ahead of time. So the question is kind of, you know, when these applications run and they ask things from the kernel, how is the kernel gonna allocate resources for, for one of these requests? And so uh, to, to dig into this, let's look at just a particular example. So uh, this diagram is uh, for a capsule called a software timer, which basically takes a, hard, a single hardware alarm and uses it to expose a bunch of virtual timers to however many processes are on the device. And the problem is that the software timer doesn't know ahead of time if there's gonna be one process or a bunch of processes, or if one process will, will ask for a timer, or if a bunch will, or if most won't, but one will ask for a bunch of timers. And so the question is, kind of where do we allocate slots to keep track of these, uh, of these timers? So, you know, the typical answer in, in embedded systems is just to statically allocate a fixed number of timer states. Uh, 
But the problem in this world where we don't know ahead of time what the workload is going to be is kind of twofold. On the one hand, if we don't use up all of our timer slots, well, we're wasting sort of precious memory that we could use elsewhere in the system. And once we do use up all the slots, then you know, the next request that comes in, we won't be able to service and we'll need to kill the process or maybe block it, but that would be weird for a timer. So you know, at a high level, static allocation forces us to trade off the memory efficiency of our system uh, for the maximum amount of concurrency that we can support. If you're coming from sort of a traditional operating system world, maybe a more intuitive approach would be to just dynamically allocate memory from some global heap. So this time when a process asks for a timer, the driver is gonna allocate some memory for that slot from a global kernel heap. And of course, other drivers are gonna do the same thing, but eventually another process might kind of come along and ask for a resource and there's no memory available. So again, we'll have to crash the process or block it or something. But even worse, you know, this time it, it may be a process that's asking for resources from a driver that's not particularly memory hungry and we still might have to block it. So this is again the same problem that we had with the Lua system where this dynamic allocation can lead to unpredictable shortages where one process's demands for kernel resources are impacting another process's demands. And so, you know, I think really what's going on is we've constructed this sort of nice clean world where each process has its own dedicated memory region and they can't touch each other, but then reintroduce this shared resource, this global kernel heap that processes can sort of exhaust from each other. And we've failed to ask these two, I think, critical questions. You know, when a driver allocates uh, some piece of memory for a process, who should be charged for it? And importantly, when is it gonna be safe to, to free that memory? And so in talk, we deal with this problem using a mechanism called grants. So grants basically provide per process kernel heaps instead of a single global heap. So the, each process has its own dedicated memory, memory region, and the top of that memory region is sort of reserved for the kernel. Uh, right, the bottom can be the stack and data and heap for the process itself, but this grant section at the top, the process can't, can't access. We block access to it using the hardware. And it's used to allocate memory from the kernel that's specific to a particular process. And so this way, the idea is that allocations for one process can't impact another's ability to, um, to get resources as well, because if a single grant section is exhausted, you know, we might have to kill that process, but the rest of the system is, isn't impacted. And it's important that all of the process resources, including this grant section, should be uh, able to be freed as soon as we terminate a process, um, right? Because again, memory is precious and we'd like to be able to reuse it as soon as possible. So let's see how this plays out in our example. This time when processes ask for timers, the driver is just gonna allocate some, uh, some grant in each process's grant section. And if a process asks for more than one timer, we'll just allocate several uh, grants. And if it asks for too many resources, we might have to kill a process, but the rest of the system sort of just keeps on going. And so in this sense, grants sort of help us balance the safety and reliability of static allocation with the flexibility that we got from dynamic allocation. And because we're able to free all of the memory, including the grant section, immediately when the process dies, we can also just respawn the process and get another, give it another chance or maybe run a different process. But if we do that, it's really important to make sure that the kernel doesn't have sort of outstanding references to this grant section that we just freed, right? And so one way you might think about doing that is basically when a process dies, asking every driver to sort of clean up after itself. You know? Make sure that you've cleaned up any references uh, in your data structures to this, uh, to this process's grant section. But remember, we don't assume that drivers are bug free, and this is, a, this is a particularly pernicious bug. If a driver forgets to clean up a reference, all of a sudden we have a dangling pointer, and we potentially lost all this nice safety that we got from the, from the type system. Uh, and so in talks with grants, we sort of, again, actually leverage the type system to get this property. In particular, capsules don't actually get to store sort of long-term uh, references to grant allocations. And instead, what they have is, uh, is uh, this sort of abstract grant of a particular type, which they can reify by passing an opaque process ID into the enter method. And the enter method is going to check, is this process still alive? And only if the process is still alive will it execute a closure that the capsule passes in. That's this uh, closure that starts with this timer argument. And then inside the closure, that's the only place that the capsule actually has a direct access to a reference to this grant allocated memory. 
And then finally, it's of course really important to make sure that there's no way for this, uh, in this case, this timer reference that's passed into the closure has any way of escaping uh, the, the closure, because of course the whole point was to not allow capsules to have long-lived references. And so here we use this property of the Rust type system called lifetimes to enforce exactly that. So you know, for my PL homies out there, this is the uh, signature for the enter method. And the important property that we care about is that this tick a lifetime that constrains the self argument um, is uh, totally unrelated to this existential tick B. If you didn't understand that, uh, it doesn't matter. All, all these actually go away when we actually, uh, yeah, th these are implied in the type, so you don't need to type this. Okay, so, uh, so using these, these lifetimes and this architecture of the grants, uh, you know, we're able to guarantee this property that, uh, that we can completely just sort of mem zero a process's memory as soon as it dies, but it's not totally free. In particular, uh, this mechanism means that we can't have sort of cross-process data structures. So an intuitive way to structure this timer driver, for example, is to basically store all the outstanding virtual timers in some ordered data structure like a priority heap or a linked list or something like that. Um, the problem is that if we're using grants and one of the processes dies, then you know, some of the links along the way disappear and now our data structure is potentially meaningless. We've lost a bunch of other, uh, uh, a bunch of other timers. So with grants, we really need to separate these data structures. So we can have you know, an arbitrarily complex data structure for each process, but they have to be totally separate and they can't have references across each other. This effectively means that when, a, when an event comes in for the timer driver, we're gonna need to iterate across whichever processes may have allocated a, a, a timer to figure out which, which timer to service. So you know, that's kind of a bummer from a scalability perspective. Uh, it means that you know, while if we had sort of an optimal data structure, we could have as many processes as we want and it would take you know, the same amount of time to service a, an alarm. Um, with grants, you know, it basically scales, uh, or doesn't scale, I guess, linearly. But the, you know, the, the saving grace is that iterating over a data structure is pretty fast, at least compared to sort of real world events. And in fact, uh, we're pretty limited with RAM, so we can't fit that many processes on a device in the first place. So you know, with the maximum number of processes that I managed to fit on one of the platforms that we have was about 17 processes. Uh, the time it takes to iterate and service one of these timers is uh, about an order of magnitude less than the sort of lowest frequency that we can configure the, the timer on the same system. So, uh, you know, in most cases, this sort of works out okay. Um, okay, I have some time, so I can go into this. So I, I wanna uh, end this part of the presentation by digging into sort of why Rust in particular was an interesting choice of language for these kinds of, uh, these kinds of systems, and also uh, one of the challenges sort of associated with using that language. So at a high level, Rust is just a type in memory safe language. So that means that just like other type in memory safe languages like Java or Haskell or Python or whatever, um, it eliminates a whole bunch of bugs just by construction. So we don't have buffer overflows or use after freeze. Uh, and in Rust, the type safe uh, type system is enforced at compile time, which means that there's, there isn't the overhead of sort of runtime dynamic checks of the types. Um, and then unlike most other type safe languages, Rust doesn't rely on a garbage collector in order to, uh, to guarantee sort of memory safety, in order to do memory allocation. And so that means that we get to have fairly fine grained control over how and where memory is laid out, as well as you know, the, the runtime behavior of, the, of, the, of our code. And so the upshot is that once we compile a Rust program, uh, you know, it, it sort of behaves and uh, behaves a lot like a, a similarly written C program. So, you know, the, the way that it, uh, uh, what it replaces garbage collection with in order to manage memory is a type system called ownership, which is sort of similar to linear and affine types from the literature. And the key property here is basically that every value in a program has exactly one owner, in particular the variable that it's bound to. And so the compiler knows that as soon as that owner goes out of scope, we can deallocate the memory either by popping the stack or calling free or something like that. Uh, but it also means that reassigning a variable doesn't mean the same thing it means in most other languages. In particular, if we reassign this uh, value bound to x to the variable y, then it's not an alias, but in fact, x becomes an invalid uh, reference. So you know, we can access y, we can print it, for example, but x is now uh, invalid. Uh, and that's sort of a little bit cumbersome to, to deal with ubiquitously, just as is, and so Rust uses this notion of borrowing, which sort of reuses the reference idea to allow you to sort of lend out temporary access to a variable while we're still retaining ownership. So here, this my resource variable is gonna be uh, lent out, in this case, mutably, 
uh, meaning the, uh, the, uh, the person, sorry, this transform method can actually mutate the underlying value uh, to this transform method. But when the transform method returns, you know, I still have uh, access, to, access to this my, uh, my resource variable. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and, uh, uh, but there's sort of a catch. We basically have two kinds of references that we cr can create with different restrictions. So if we have mutable references, we can mutate the underlying value, but that has to be a unique references. There can be no other outstanding references at the same time. Uh, or we can have shared references, but then uh, those can't mutate the value, at least not by default. And so for a system like Talk, this is kind of problematic. Because you know, this is, at the end of the day, what a system uh, like Talk looks like. You know, we have some low-level drivers and some high-level drivers, and we want to be able to deliver events from the hardware into higher-level drivers. And similarly, the higher-level drivers want to be able to deliver syscalls down to the hardware. And of course, we want to be able to mutate things here, because you know, otherwise, we're kind of not doing anything. And so this uniqueness versus mutability uh, problem is, is, uh, is problematic. And you know, Rust uses that for a variety of things, including like thread safety. But the really core problem here is something that, uh, that Dan pointed out, Dan Grossman pointed out like 10 years ago, 15 years ago almost, uh, which is that there's a, sort of a fundamental trade-off between being able to use some types, which is basically like tagged unions in C, uh, and shared mutability, and the ability to have uh, two references to the same thing where one of them is mutable. So to illustrate this, this is a somewhat contrived example, but I think it's, it's helpful. Um, this number pointer enum is uh, a sum type in, in Rust. This is basically uh, a, a value that can take on two shapes at runtime. It can be either a num, which is just an arbitrary u32, or a pointer, which is a reference in this case to a u32. And importantly, in each case, they're going to take up the exact same sort of four bytes of memory, uh, even though they're two different shapes. And so if we had a language that didn't enforce uh, uh, uniqueness when you had mutable references, if you had shared mutability, what could we do? Well, uh, you know, in this code snippet below, uh, this is sort of rustism to deconstruct some, some, uh, some reference, but the high level idea is that uh, when we're inside of this if statement, we basically have two uh, valid references. One is this external reference to the, uh, to the number pointer thing, to a reference to the number pointer, and we have an internal reference to the thing inside the, uh, the value, which in this case is going to be uh, our pointer, our reference to U32. And if Rust allowed us to do this, then we could now use this external, use this external variable to change the shape of, uh, of the value, in particular to a, a, a num. And because it's a num, we can use any value that we want. Um, but the internal variable still thinks that it's talking about a reference. And so now, uh, now that we've changed the underlying sort of four bytes of memory uh, to some arbitrary address in this case, then you know, we can use this internal variable to dereference some random piece of memory, and we can get a seg fault or, or, or worse than that. But of course, Rust doesn't allow this. Uh, that's the point of sort of uh, uh, having unique mutable references, because it'll notice that you know, we've, already, uh, we've already used um, sort of our one uh, mutable reference. OK, but it's not all lost, because uh, Rust sort of recognizes this, and it has uh, a notion of what they call interior, mutabil interior mutability which sort of recognizes that actually it is safe to have shared mutability in particular kinds of cases, in cases where basically we can control access to these sum types and other similar kinds of types. And so there are a few examples in the Rust core library itself. So one that we use fairly often in talk is this cell type, which is basically a wrapper around uh, any, uh, any, any kind of value that can be copied that doesn't let you have direct access to sort of internal fields, but instead only lets you copy a value out and then back in. So if we had a num pointer wrapped in a cell, we could copy the num pointer out and change it however we wanted and then overwrite the value inside the cell, but we couldn't get sort of a reference into the, one of the fields inside of the, uh, inside of the number pointer. And then we can also write our own, something like a take cell, which is kind of a mutex that's done blocking, and we use this a little bit in talk to store sort of large buffers. Um, I think what's cool here is that this is one of the tools that we can use to sort of get exactly what we want out of the, out of the developer. And if we get the developer to express basically exactly where data structures ought to be mutable, then we can actually get sort of the best of both worlds. So in talk, this stack that I showed you before looks like this. So each of these drivers has a reference to each other, and these references are not mutable, meaning they're shared references. 
And we've pushed all the mutability basically into the leaves of the data structures. So something like the next alarm is wrapped in a, in a cell type that's copied in and out. And the registers of the hardware uh, is, is an array of these uh, volatile cells as a kind of cell that just also enforces volatile semantics. Okay, so I've talked about this, uh, this system that I think. Question? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so go back to the question. Uh, uh, so it seems like one of the things that you've done is uh, uh, to try to basically build this uh, ability to build kernel modules uh, that do dynamic allocation while still maintaining type safety. And now, a different, possibly different way that you could have gone about that uh, would have been to use the grant mechanism that you were giving to, to uh, essentially user processes and, and drive kernel modules that their interaction with each other was through grants. That is, that essentially no kernel module does dynamic allocation. That is, all memory that they might use is something that's donated by the, by the user of the interface rather than, than generated locally. Yeah, let me see if I can, under, if I can deconstruct this. Um, so uh, so uh, this sort of mechanism isn't about dynamic allocation. Uh, this is just about being able to have uh, effectively multiple entry points into the same stack in the kernel while still being able to mutate uh, something like the, the, the registers or something sure, like that. Sure, but it, I mean, uh, the reason that you were, that you were using Rust yeah. uh, versus other types of languages is that Rust has this particular way of, of managing memory <coughs> that allows you to have single ownership, but allows you to do dynamic allocation without, uh, essentially it allows you to do dynamic allocation having a garbage collector. And it seems like there might be other ways that you could go about getting rid of garbage collectors and getting and still maintaining type safety. And I guess I, the question is kind of like, uh, and in, in fact, in many ways, you were talking about one earlier, which was the kind of grant mechanism, which says that you, you any any resource that I need in the kernel is something that I get from user space. Um, That's how I make sure that I run out, right? Uh, yeah. and, that the, and that the data I need is actually there. And so that, the question is like, oh, okay, there could be other ways that you could go about it, this. Uh, I mean, you're about to talk about the evaluation. I sure. assume that doesn't talk about it. That's why I was asking. Totally. Um, uh, so I think the details of this might be a longer discussion that we should uh, not defer a little bit. I actually don't think that it's just about being able to dynamically allocate memory. I think that garbage, the model of garbage collection, uh, in the model of garbage collection sort of everything, at least conceptually, is allocated on the heap. And that's sort of how you manage all memory, including, for example, you know, uh, what looks like stack allocated values that are sort of passed up in your uh, return value. But, uh, but also, yes, there, there, there could be other ways that you might imagine doing this. And the, the choice was really, um, right, at the end of the day, we sort of cared about being able to evaluate this in practice. And so I think um, our hypothesis was, that we needed to go with a language that exists and has documentation and people, people can sort of uh, actually pick up and use. And so in many ways, the choice of using Rust was just like, this is the language that we have that doesn't use garbage collection. Um, does that answer enough, at least? OK. So, we, uh, okay. so I, I've talked about the system that we, that we built uh, that provides, I think, the kinds of properties that I laid out at the beginning. But ultimately, as I said, this is an empirical question of whether we actually design these APIs correctly and whether things like the threat model are, are actually applicable in the real world. And so we've been spending the last few years sort of evaluating talk with, uh, with practitioners in various ways. So I'll first tell you about a, a few users of talk that, that we've been evaluating with. So in many ways, the sort of driving application for talk has always been this project out of uh, Michigan and now UC Berkeley called Signpost. So Signpost is a modular city scale sensing platform Basically what that means is that there's a bunch of these sort of signpost looking things scattered around the Berkeley campus. And they each have sort of a, a, um, a solar panel and a, a low power wireless radio. But there's no sort of native sensors on the device itself. Instead it has sort of eight slots where other people can build hardware modules with sensors and a microcontroller and plug them into these slots and sort of leverage uh, the power and networking on the, on the platform itself. And then ultimately other people researchers can build applications to run on whatever existing sensors are already out there. And so we very well might have a scenario where multiple researchers are running experiments on the same uh, sort of module at the same time. 
Uh, there's this startup called Helium, which is one of these sort of end-to-end -end IoT solutions. They have like a cloud service and a gateway device. But for our purposes, one of the components is this programmable module that basically takes care of sort of end-to-end -end communication, encrypted communication with their cloud, as well as uh, takes care of software updates using sort of a microcontroller on this module, as well as like an, enc an encryption key and a radio. But then the customers that buy these modules and stick them on their hardware also write code to actually interface with whatever sensors or actuators on the hardware. And so it's really important for them that whatever code the customers write on their modules can't somehow brick the microcontroller because then it's hosed, right? Their, their update code is also, uh, is also not going to work. And interestingly, before, um, in, a, in sort of a previous version of this module, they used a system very similar to what Mike and Gabe built originally using Lua, in this case, on top of FreeRTOS and had exactly the same problems. Their customers sort of kept running out of memory and had to upgrade to a larger, more power-hungry microcontroller, and it still was happening. So ultimately, you know, they decided to switch to talk, and the, the next version of their module that's coming out in a few months is going to be uh, running talk. Uh, and then finally, I spent a summer at Google on the, uh, on the Titan team. So Titan is this um, security-hardened microcontroller that Google has built, and they're using it internally for a bunch of different uh, projects, including their root of trust for production servers, and they're replacing some of the authentication keys internally uh, uh, with, uh, with versions that use Titan. And, uh, and so the, their kind of interest in systems like Talk is that at the moment, you know, with their own home-baked system, basically, the state of the world is that uh, you know, two engineers that are sort of deemed the security and microcontroller experts like literally have to audit every single line of code that anybody might uh, put on a Titan device. And so that's a, a huge problem for uh, innovation internally uh, for this device. And then we've also evaluated a number of other ways. So there's a number of other researchers that are using Talk also to deploy sensor networks. We've been running these half-day tutorials at various conferences to get sort of one-on-one -on -one experience with people writing uh, capsules and processes for the first time. There's a growing open source community around Talk. And then uh, my co-advisor, Phil Levis, has been using Talk to teach sort of a similar embedded systems class at Stanford to what Mike and Gabe did at, at Berkeley. And so with this experience, we can start to answer some end-to-end -end security questions. Like, is the threat model that I set out at the beginning with these application developers that are totally untrusted and these weird capsules that have people that are sort of kind of, un kind of trusted, uh, does that actually map to sort of real-world use cases? So we can look at the deployments of talk and see how well this threat model sort of maps to, to the principles in their scenarios. So with something like signposts, you know, applications are written by researchers, and ideally they can be anyone who... Uh, who wants to run a sensor network experiment. And the capsules are going to be written by module builders with particular sensors they want, that they want to uh, put on their board. And then the trusted computing base is the, the, this platform code is, is written by the signpost authors, and I dabble a little bit as well. And similarly with Helium, you know, these customers are hopefully not malicious, but they're certainly not trusted to sort of not break the device. And the capsule is written by a combination of the community or the, uh, the customers themselves as well as you know, uh, Helium. Uh, and then the, the platform is, of course, controlled by Helium. And then I also said that it's important to be able to extend the trusted computing base safely, right? Because I'm not going to write the, uh, the platform code for every single device out there. And so first, we can note that sort of a bunch of common problems in kernels we just avoid by construction. So things like having to synchronize between uh, shared data structures among the interrupt context and like the main thread context. In typical kernels, well, you know, talk is single-threaded, so this is just not a problem. Uh, you know, often you might uh, accidentally stick an untrusted user pointer somewhere that, uh, that the, the system expects a kernel pointer. And so in talk, we just use the type system to sort of wrap user pointers in a type that can't be, uh, uh, can't be assigned somewhere that we expect a kernel pointer. And things like user, use after free, we just kind of get by the, uh, from the Rust type system. And then we can look at how code actually breaks down in these systems. So uh, these are two modules from signposts that are currently deployed, and the breakdown of where code actually goes in practice in each of these. Uh, so as we would hope, sort of the vast majority of code lives in one of these two isolation mechanisms, either processes or capsules, and the majority is in these sort of fully untrusted processes. And you know, there's sort of a non-trivial amount of code that's part of this platform code, this trusted computing base, but actually a relatively small amount that actually needs to sort of get around the Rust type system. So the number of lines of code that you really need to carefully audit to make sure that you've not done something horrendously wrong is uh, still relatively small. 
And then finally, you know, of course, can developers actually build applications for this system? Uh, so here, you know, I think the proof is kind of in the pudding. There's applications out there that people built that are, that are running on talk. Uh, but we can at least ask sort of whether the system is able to provide the kinds of properties that people care about. So in sensor networks, one thing you might really care about is energy consumption. And so this is taken, uh, this graph is taken from the signpost paper. Uh, I had nothing to do with it. Um, and just shows the breakdown of sort of where energy goes in signpost. Uh, and so, so you know, uh, some of the energy does go to processing. And in fact, you know, probably some of it goes to the overhead of doing system calls, for example. But as we'd hope, sort of the vast majority of energy is spent doing sensing and networking and other things. Okay, so that was talk. I want to just briefly talk about two other projects that I, uh, that I also worked on during my PhD. So uh, Hales is this web platform that's trying to solve exactly the tension that we're seeing today with platforms like Facebook, where you know, third-party applications just can't be trusted uh, to not leak private, uh, private user data. And so the idea with Hales is to co-locate all applications on sort of trusted hardware and then use a mechanism called De decentralized information flow control to make sure that sensitive data doesn't leak to untrusted sources no matter which code operates on it. So you know, typically with these information flow control systems, uh, it's, it's pretty difficult to, uh, to build applications and to write policies. And so we spent a bunch of time sort of evaluating our system with, uh, with, with students and other, other collaborators to see you know, how could we improve the APIs uh, to do this. And we found that in particular, if you can get the policy writer to write it in terms of a function over the data model, sort of when they're defining the data model itself, that actually works pretty well. Another project is a, a system called Beetle that is trying to solve this problem that in uh, many IoT systems, the peripherals uh, sort of need to be exclusively owned by one application at a time. The peripherals themselves are often low power, and so they are just not able to, uh, to manage sort of multiple sessions at a time. And the gateway devices like phones or home routers, um, they don't necessarily understand application semantics, and so it's not clear sort of how to multiplex these devices. Um, but at least in Bluetooth Low Energy, it turns out that there's this part of the protocol called GAT, which devices and applications already use to communicate that sort of gives us everything we need. It sort of turns out that if you understand where an application transaction begins and ends, that's enough to build a gateway system that doesn't have to understand anything about the application, but can still do sort of safe multiplexing. Okay, so uh, talk itself is uh, uh, sort of, I think, opens up a, a, a whole bunch of other research questions to do with, you know, what are the operating system abstractions for a multi-program sort of low power system? So one example of this is that we're looking at now is how to efficiently manage the variety of clock domains that you can use to drive peripherals uh, on these microcontrollers without knowing ahead of time what the application workload is gonna be. Uh, and then I'm also really interested in thinking about, you know, now that we have isolation, how can we articulate sort of higher level security policies uh, uh, beyond that? And then I'm also interested in uh, exploring these kinds of questions in other domains. So the Internet of Things more broadly, I think, is a super interesting space to, 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 add, to be asking these questions. Uh, I'm still very interested in sort of pushing uh, projects like Beetle even further. But I'm also in interested in totally other domains. So you know, the fact that programmable hardware like FPGAs is starting to show up on everything from small embedded devices to sort of large servers, uh, I think raises the question of, you know, how could applications use these FPGAs, and if we expose them directly to applications, what are the operating system abstractions to, to do that? Sort of what's the overhead of multiplexing and sharing, and what are the security concerns that show up um, when we do that? And then finally, I'm really interested in this sort of space of serverless computing, uh, where basically cloud programmers are decomposing their applications into sort of small, uh, short-lived, almost pure computations. Uh, and I think that that actually means that we can rethink a lot of the ways in which cloud infrastructure is built. So at a high level, you know, my goal is to maximize the number of developers that can improve uh, any particular system. And you know, this trade-off between flexibility and security is a long-standing problem, but I actually think that there's a ton of opportunity today uh, to try and resolve it. In particular, we have um, lots of opportunities to actually deploy secure research systems in practice and evaluate their APIs. And we have new tools like programming languages and hardware which I think can let us do an even better job of, of providing those abstractions. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take some more questions. Thank you.
there's been some work, I guess it was a few years ago, where people were also interested in getting the sort of economics right for allocation in systems like currency and cinder. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of compare those a little bit and, and why the mechanisms here are, are sort of different. Uh, it seems like some of it's set up so that you can get more mileage out of rust, but I, I, I have a sense of that the, the mechanisms are also slightly different in this context. Um, yeah, so if I understand the question is basically how does the notion of grants compare to other mechanisms and system like, uh, systems like Cinder? Um, I'm actually not familiar with currency, so maybe you can tell me about that later. But uh, so, so Cinder, to my understanding, deals with, uh, with energy resources. Um, I think in, uh, in some ways, there's a sort of a philosophical similarity um, in, uh, in the sense that Cinder sort of uh, figures out how to account for exactly who to charge for particular, in this case, usage of energy, not memory. Uh, and I think the, the, the main mechanistic difference is basically that memory is a sort of fundamental thing for writing a program. And so you just need to control in, the, in I think, a pretty different way. Like, it's basically just not, it's not enough to just account for the memory in this case. In this case, we're also concerned about how to, I mean, we're primarily, in fact, concerned with exactly how to reap that memory uh, when we know that some component has gone over. Whereas I think with energy, that doesn't really... Uh... You don't get it back. Exactly. Yeah, Tom. To follow up, I mean, if this was a, a highly memory, con uh, sorry, power constrained setting, like, uh, you know, something that was self-powered, for example, then you could well think that the application completely crashes in the same way that you, if, when you run out of memory, yeah. if, you, if you ask for kernel resources that, that use too much power. Um, and that seems like that ought to be something that you could account for in the same way. Um, uh, right, so at, at a high level, basically, uh, in, in many cases, and in fact, these are cases that we're in principle at least concerned with, uh, energy, is a, or, sorry, energy is as, if not more, um, sort of a problematic resource to deal with than as, uh, as memory. Um, and I, I agree with that. We haven't addressed it, at least not in the design that I showed you, but, but I think it's a, um, a hopefully orthogonal, but also extremely important thing to do. And, you know, and we're, in principle, we're working on it. Yeah, Hank. Um, this is a high level question, but it kind of follows a little bit. I wonder if these problem, memory constraint problems in particular that are driving uh, some of this are long term or short term. I was going to say uh, comically that I remember when all computers had 64 KB. <laughs> so, um, it, it seems to me that every decade approximately, there's a new platform that is hardware resource constrained but the next generations of those things often remove those problems. So I'm just wondering whether these are long-term or short-term. Yeah, so basically whether these memory constraints are going to are gonna last. Yeah, uh, and then whether those abstractions are the right ones. Right. So I think on a system, I'll start with that. I think that on a system that has vastly more memory, I don't know exactly what the, the cutoff is, but say three orders of magnitude more, I, I think we, we might drastically rethink the design. In particular, something like singularity might make a lot more sense. Uh, because then we actually get performance isolation as well. Um, as far as whether the, the constraints are sort of short-term or long-term, I kind of have two answers for that. Um, one, I, I don't really know, but in, in practice, we haven't seen the, um, the, the memory on these devices grow significantly over the last 15 years or so, primarily because they're energy constrained. Now, something like FRAM might totally change that. Um, uh, and then there's also... Uh, sort of other platforms that are even more energy constrained than the ones we have, like all the stuff that Brenda Lucia, Brendan Lucia is doing with these like mega energy harvesting devices that he's sending into space. I mean, they can't even run talk because they, they don't run for long enough at a time. Uh, if, um, if sort of memory becomes cheap enough, they might become sort of the new class of devices that we might care about. And then the second answer is that uh, I kind of don't care. And the reason is that the, the real question, the sort of primary question that I'm interested in is, uh, you know, can we show that using, in this case, type safety as sort of the main abstraction for isolation in a system is, is a viable option? Uh, in particular, like, will developers actually be able to, to sort of grok the system? And so what we care about is devices that exist today uh, and solving whatever constraints they, they, they happen to have. So if in, if in 10 years this Do you people have answered that with C sharp and singularity and those kinds of things? Um, I was convinced, but I think that 
in, in practice, no. And I, I think the reason is that, uh, that, uh, that practitioners haven't seen these things actually sort of being used in, in practice. Now, with Singularity, I think it was a great system. And I, I, I suspect that if whatever politics at Microsoft would have let it go out into the world, uh, it may have worked great, uh, although the Singularity team seems to disagree with me now. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but this is just the, the, the point that like actual, actual sort of deployment or sort of at least real world experience uh, matters regardless of whether the design was exactly right. Um, I'm curious, have you thought about, you know, like the grant mechanism when you want to make sure you don't run out of memory? Uh, sort of in the, you know, have, have you some thoughts about connection to a bunch of OSs in the literature, like capability-based OSs? to represent all the resources in your system so you make sure you don't run out of them, such as uh, keypass or arrows or, you know, recently uh, like the Verifish or SO4. Uh, do you have some thoughts on the connection between those? Yeah, so um, I've li at least looked in depth into SEL4. And there, uh, they have a different design with, different, with, the, with sort of uh, different hooks that they can use. So in SEL4, they're basically able to, so they, uh, they account for how much memory is, um, is sort of taken up by each process or by each uh, uh, service. Um, and they have sort of a fixed number of, of object types that the kernel is able to allocate. And so the process itself is sort of the thing that is able to allocate, uh, allocate that memory. Whereas in talk, we cared about extensibility inside the, uh, inside the kernel. I mean, uh, SEL4 is a microkernel, so the, just the... the the divide of, 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 uh, of where things would live is a bit different. But there, we, we didn't feel like it was appropriate to sort of restrict uh, what kinds of objects, in this case, capsules can allocate. Um, and in particular, they might, they might need to allocate things where like, the fields are sensitive or whatever. And so it's really, uh, I, think we've, I think it's not possible to do the same kind of trick that, that SEL4 does. Sort of a, sort of a uh maybe communication or translation question. Uh, when you introduced talk at the beginning, you asked um, whether we can extend the TCB safely. Uh, and I know that safety has a very particular definition in the systems community, and you, can, you uh, then add on liveness. Uh, whereas in security, uh, you know, liveness might correspond with availability, uh, but we also care about confidentiality and integrity. So when you found that yes, you could extend it safely. Does can you can you say that both the confidentiality and the integrity uh, between apps would be uh, preserved? Um, uh, that's a great question. So I, 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 I will just, just just to repeat, it's it's whether um, the TCP can can be extended not only to provide uh, kind of the uh, basic like isolation safety that we cared about, but also confidentiality, confidentiality and integrity of processes. It's actually worse. We can't say anything about that uh, without sort of thinking ad hoc about the particular system that you've constructed out of capsules, which are sort of untrusted. Um, and they do, in some sense, fundamentally share data between processes. Like a virtual timer is going to somehow leak information, could easily leak information between processes. Um, so the high level answer is no. Uh, the low, low, the, the, the maybe more um, sort of gracious answer to myself is that. Uh, I think isolation is sort of the first thing that you need in, in, in order to be able to reason about any of this. And uh, that's exactly sort of what I'm interested in looking at next, which is sort of how to enforce higher level security policies like non-interference, for example, uh, using this basis. OK, great. Uh, let's uh, thank Amit. Thank you. <laughs>